Today, you are going to be you pleased because we are talking about how to bring political intrigue to your game. I think I also like to talk about what to do with political intrigue if you are a player in one of those campaigns as well. Player. Um, You know what? We like to cover both sides of the DM screen here. Yeah, all the sides. We'll just see where the conversation goes. When we're dealing with power, who's the tool? You're getting all these layers mixed on top of each other, all these powers, all these goals, all these probabilities, flaws, all the relationships. And eventually, we're all just girls walking in spider webs. (laughs) That is (laughs) okay. (laughs) Because it's it's. Whoa. Jeez, just summon me up, right? <laughs> what are you doing? Falling sideways, apparently. <laughs> Mid summon. Mid summon. No, I was just action pose. Sitting down to a cup of coffee, but it's not here. Sideways? Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Just cantrips today, then. Yes. Anyways, uh, today's note from the DM reads: Attention, read out loud exactly what is written on this note, or be destroyed. And replaced. Welcome to Caffeine and Cantrips, the show where we talk about D&D or else. Hello, viewer, if that is your real name. We've been watching you. Oh, yes. We've been watching you for quite some time now, and we want to make a deal. By number 548 has the goods, and I got the troops. The Sean 604s, best of the best. Best of the best. All we need is, is you to get us there. Don't worry. Your DM will never see this coming. Wham bam, thank you for the XP, ma'am. Romeo Echo Delta rules from here on in. Ooh. Never eat anything you don't prepare. Ooh. Never sit with your back facing the door. Always have a go bag ready. Oh, always have a go bag ready. It's time to learn how to earn your seat at the big table. Oh. Your go bag. Well, hey there. Um, welcome to Cabin and Can Trips. <laughs> yeah. uh, super happy that you're joining us here today. Uh, and yeah, get that seat at the big table. The big one. What does that mean? What are we talking about today? Yeah, what even is a seat? Today, <clears throat> it's a mimic. Um, <laughs> oh, shoot. Today, you are going to be you pleased because we are talking about how to bring political intrigue to your game. Mm. Now, political intrigue is is kind of one of those things that I think a lot of people want to do, but they just do really they? don't know how. Do you to add parts or whole chunks? Yeah, right. It's it's difficult. <clears throat> and excuse me, I'm a little bit uh, sick, so you have to bear with me. A little bit what? Editor, save me. <laughs> um, yeah, we don't have paladins in my reality, so I can't just mm. get out. out you yeah, go. Walmart's though. It's, yeah. it's almost there. <laughs> <laughs> but um, one of the issues is is we can't necessarily go from like little red riding hood to james bond in our storytelling right like it's it's very difficult to make that i'll play that campaign if you don't know where (laughs) to start uh it all starts with a little wolf um no it's (laughs) it gets it gets really kind of cumbersome and difficult to make headway when you don't know what it is that you're trying to break down okay i think i think today political intrigue we would like to help you um, whether this is a new thing for you or whether you're practiced at it, maybe we can give you a bit, bit of a different perspective. Mm-hmm. But it is on how to add that political intrigue into your game. Mm-hmm. Well, if, from a DM's perspective, I think I also like to talk about uh, what to do with political intrigue if you are a player in if one of those campaigns player. as well. Player. Um, you know what? We like to cover both sides of the DM screen here. Yeah, all the sides. We'll just see where the conversation goes. Okay. Yeah. Um, Take but, us away. So, I think how I start to consider political intrigue from the kind of foundations upwards is stories of political intrigue begin with the concept of power. Oh, we're talking about what is political intrigue? Well, this is where I want to start. Okay, okay. Because I think in order to have political intrigue in your game, you need to have a foundational understanding of what it is that your game is going to be about. Oh, What does the merry-go-round revolve around Mm -hmm. in this case? Mm -hmm. And one of the big questions that I think comes out of this is when we're dealing with power, who's the tool? You're the tool. <laughs> I am the tool. Um, it's, it's something that 
has connotation to it. It's one of those kind of biased things okay. that, we, that we initially consider because power is just a thing, right? It, it is by itself a tool to be used. And whether mm. or not you are um, using that tool for good, you're using that tool for evil, right? It is something that is just by itself a tool. Once we put the context around it and we flavor right. and we put the story around it, then a bad thing could be good, a good thing could be bad. Right. It changes the entire story. Right, like a knife is just a knife, but depending on how you use it, yeah. it's are either a cooking utensil or, or it's yeah. a murder weapon. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this is kind of the, the raw concept of what a part of or a great part of your story could be based around if you're trying to add a lot of political intrigue. So the first thing mm -hmm. that I think we need to understand when we're looking at power is the rationalized power versus abusive power. Because we, oh, we, interesting dichotomy. we okay. all have power in our lives. Whether you know it or not, whether you feel it or not, whether you specifically kind of engage with it or not, you have power in your life. Um, some of the things that we like to think about. More than you think. More than you think. So one of the great things I think that most of us have dealt with before is kids. Uh, you, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you have this assumed rationalized power that I just, I know more than you. Don't touch that. Don't go there. Don't do this. Right. Because I know better than you. Now, whether you go, well, because I have the power or because I'm bigger than you or because whatever the reason is, you're rationalizing that. And that's just part of your world. Now, this could also be I've been at the job longer than you. So I know to put this on the right, not on the left. Just mm -hmm. because it's easier in your workflow and it's more simple right. to do it this way, right? Like simple things. Now, those are kind of rationalized power. This is power that we just assume because it's part of our day or part of our lives or part of our kind of general conception. Mm -hmm. And we don't step back and kind of analyze the things that we know. Okay. Because there are already things that we know, mm -hmm. right? And this is quite often what leads us to abusing power because we're not checking ourselves. On that kind of stuff. Check yourself. Check yourself before you wreck, wreck those yourself. Kids. Uh, so uh. when I'm talking about rationalizing versus abusing power, um, before I said it is a tool. Mm -hmm. So as a tool, positive um, kind of journeys that we can take when dealing with power are developing leadership skills, developing decision making skills, uh, developing responsibility. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. These things like you don't take the five dollars out of the till because it's open. Right. You don't do that because you have the responsibility. Could right. you? Well, there's consequences and stuff. And we can talk about that later. But you know that you don't do that because you're responsible for what's in that till. Well, like Batman, not Batman, like like Spider-Man says, right? Um, or Peter, Peter Parker's uncle, really. <laughs> keep going. Yeah. Right. He says with great power with is great responsibility. Right. Correct. But the implication is with power comes responsibility. Yes. If you simplify it even more, right? Right. If you have a little power, a little bit of responsibility, but you still have responsibility. Correct. Right? Because if you don't, then it goes haywire. Right. right. And only people with no power have no responsibility. Yes. And you have some, so you have some. Mm -hmm. Kind of a hand-in-hand -hand thing, right? And so when we don't utilize this power, we don't utilize this focus and energy to develop ourselves, develop those positive traits, leadership, decision-making, responsibility, then it turns into abuse of power. Okay. Right? So just like, hey, new guy, you mop the floor tonight. I know it says me on the chart, but I've been here longer, <laughs> and I'm going to go sit down and do this really complicated Sudoku because uh, <laughs> it looks like paperwork, but you're going to do it because I've been here longer. Right, you're a new guy. Right? You're the new guy now. <laughs> now, when we, when we escalate this, of course, when someone has a lot of power, like we see in real life, sometimes they're bad apples out there, some police. Mm. could be bad, right? Mm -hmm. You could have great police and you could have terrible police. Same job, same yep. responsibilities, a use of power and a misuse of power can go side by side. Yeah. Right? So authoritarian behavior is another one of those things where mm. I say goes. Why? Because I have the power, right? right? For whatever reason, we're not talking about all the facets and all that, but there's just power as a thing, right? So abuse of power, authoritarian behavior, lack of empathy for those that don't have equal to or more power than you. Okay. Right? Yep. Right? Oh, mm -hmm. people on minimum wage, right? <laughs> they can they can suffer because, you know, or why do they need to go and buy avocado toast? Those Gen Z guys, right. right? Just let them eat cake. Just let them eat cake. Why can't they buy a house? Stop eating avocado toast. Right? There's all of these terrible kind of paradigms 
that you can view others from and stereotype them. Yeah. And you lose that empathy because you have a power, in this case, a wealth or economic power. Right. And side note, the lady who said, let them eat cake, got her head cut off. <sighs> but she was really pretty. Was she, though? A- apparently. I don't know. They used a lot of makeup back then. And the standards of beauty was very different. Very back then. different. Yeah. Very different. Nonetheless. So moving forward, I would like to kind of define power. Here, Ooh, where we're going okay. forward, just in this okay. kind of context. I'm going to try to, and Sean's going to, Sean's going to say some stuff. But power <laughs> is the ability to influence, control, or direct behavior, actions, or decisions of others. Okay. Power can be both formal, like a position of authority, mm-hmm. like a police officer, or like an officer in the army, right? Or it can be informal, like the cool kids at high school. Mm. Okay. It's complex, it is multifaceted as a concept, and its dynamics vary significantly depending on the context of the situation. Yes. So in defining it, I have not defined anything, really, and I apologize for that. You have, and because power really, it's a very simple concept uh, as a concept, but in the manifestation in the world, it's very complex. Right. Right. Because I would even define it is even simpler is just the ability to, to influence the world around you. Be it, yes. be it people, environments, whatever, right? Sure. Just straight up influence. Now, there is a reason why I have broken it down. I know. As far as I yes. have, right? For control, directing behavior, actions, and decisions. Because it's of political others. intrigue. Um, because political intrigue is what we're talking mm-hmm. about here today. And because I do want to break out different types of power later. Okay. And we've talked about it before, hard and soft one up, but I want to break those out a little power more. Power to move hard. It's important when we're talking about this specifically. Yeah. So with that definition in mind, I think... When we start, this is where we start talking about D&D, TTRPGs and whatnot now. Okay. Okay. This is the kind of now we're jumping in. So when we're talking about this, I'm going to question your concept of power in the character that you're building before you even reach session zero. Mm, Okay. Okay. Cool. And, And one of the great and easy ways that I can do that is ask, you know, how do we think about interacting with power when we build the characters? When stereotypically, like the number one choice out there are human fighters. Is it the number one choice? Uh, yeah, I, I believe so. I don't know if they've updated the statistics or whatnot, but in like 2020 on D&D Beyond, it was of single class characters. The number one pick statistically was a human fighter. It's one of the best base classes. Absolutely. <laughs> That's why. But now when we're talking about political intrigue, this means that, or at least in the concept of power, this means that most people are going to be doing a hard power style physical yes. attack on the world, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. That's what a f- human fighter does. Now, if that isn't enough for you to talk about people just wanting to use power physically to overcome their thing. Direct physical to, power, right, yeah. To overcome their, their world or their barriers, challenges. What about your story? Are you a wizard who wants to become the best or top like Archmage? Do you want to become the god of magic? Do you want to become the most well-known, most famous bard ever? Do you Mm. become the most innately powerful uh, sorcerer? Right. right? Or warlock. Do you just want that power and so you've traded parts of yourself? You just want friends. Right? All of these things are desiring power to overcome kind of everything else. It's Mm. having an abundance of power so that they can do whatever they want in the world or achieve certain heights. Right. Right. So are you having the conversation or the quiet conversation about what is power to your character? How is your character going to interact with this thing that does change when we're talking about the context? Mm -hmm. The context is whatever story you're trying to tell. Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. So, so even our fantasies have an interaction with, uh, with power and, and what makes it a fantasy not necessarily TTRPG fantasy, mm-hmm. but what makes it a fantasy is probably an interaction with power that we cannot uh, kind of attain in our regular lives. Okay. Right? Mm-hmm. So when we get into a TTRPG, when we are doing fantastical things. Like superhero can, movies. Superheroes, stories, right? Yeah. Ninth level spells, you know, mm-hmm. four attacks in a round. These are all kind of amazing <laughs> things that you are doing, but it's an interaction with power. Okay. 
right? Every character is doing it. So how, yeah. how is your character playing along with that? How are they using this raw tool to express that onto the world around them? It's interesting because, yeah, the character classes is really just different ways of of manifesting power in the world and influence into the it world. It absolutely is. Yeah. It absolutely is. Mm. So are you having that conversation? And that's why I'm calling it the quiet conversation because this is one of the things that we don't necessarily analyze, right? What do I want to do? Well, this is how I want to fight. Okay, cool. Some people build how I want my fight mechanics. Some people build how I want my role play mechanics. Even like, why do I want to fight? Right? Why do I want high charisma? Right. Right. That, that is a form of power. Um, but anyway, so, so we need to tame the beast here. Okay. Um, we need to focus in and really talk about scoping power into TTRPGs, into fifth ed or whatever system that you are playing and, and focus this in onto political intrigue. Okay. Because political intrigue yeah, is the exploration kind. of stories and decisions that have to do with power. It's accumulation, the balance, and the sacrifice of it. Mm, mm-hmm. This is mm-hmm. and this is this is political intrigue, right? Now I'm putting a box around. This I like it. I like one. it. I like those okay. three. Okay. Say it again. Uh, it's the so of power. It's the accumulation, the balance, and the sacrifice. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Now. When we're talking about political intrigue style stories, I believe there are two major types of political, of political intrigue, intrigue, stories. intrigue stories. Okay. The first one I want to call institutional engagement. Okay. This is where you are attempting to change the system. This is mm. where you are using the power that you accumulate to work either with or against the system to tear it all down. Oh, geez, like role playing activists. We're playing activists, anarchists, whatever it is, druidists, yeah. um, but <laughs> <laughs> shadow council for the win. Um, so this is, this is one of the ways that you're going about it. And this does not give you the true political intrigue statement. Mm. And the reason it doesn't is because you have not engaged in political intrigue. You've engaged in political destruction. You are changing the system. You are not playing with the system and kind of being buried in it a little bit. Hmm. Right? Well, you've got it's political, but it's no intrigue. No, no, because you're you're using Yet. your power to break the system and to kind of force your way out. Okay. The other one is what I would call the compliance chronicle. Where do you come up with these? Okay, the compliance <laughs> chronicles. Because yeah, things. Um, <laughs> so this is this is really an interesting one because this one kind of breaks up a little bit um, as well. The normal version of this is where you stick to the system. So remember that a political intrigue is not what you want the system to be. It's working within what the system is. Hmm. So if the system is not just, but you want it to be, well, then you have to get within the system and change the system, not break it to make it more just, right? To find those people perhaps that are weaker, don't have the support and power and lift them up so that they're in the higher echelons when all of their kind of enemies are trying to tear them down because they like the way that it is. They like if it's corrupt, if you know, you got to grease palms and you got to kind of cut corners in order to make it somewhere. It gets tough. Now, even if, and I, just give me one second, yeah, yeah, cool. even if you are working on something that I'm going to call transformational resistance. Yeah. This is where your character goes in with high hopes, right? They are, they are clean. They are not dirty from their actions. Pure. And and in order to get where they want to go, they make one sacrifice. Yep. And then another and another and another and And another 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 one. Um, (laughs) And eventually you find that the character with the highest hopes Right, um, can fall into that, you know, idiom. The the road to hell is paved with good intentions. That's what happened to Emperor Palpatine, right? Um, he just wanted to bring order to the universe. Yeah, do it. <laughs> um, I I I don't think so. Um, no, I don't. That's think a so conversation either. for a different time. <laughs> but the the idea is that within the compliance chronicle, there can be a story told of how the person who is just, who is righteous, who is kind of that shining knight on the hill um, loses that. And whether they lose that reputationally, whether they lose that in actuality, because in order to change the system, they find out that the system can't be changed. And there's an acquiescence mm-hmm. unto having to play the game in order to somehow change it in the long run, mm-hmm. working from the inside mm-hmm. out. 
right? So institutional engagement is not really your truest political intrigue. I think it's when you get into that compliance chronicle where you accept the rules of the game and you play that. Whether you play it malicious compliance-wise or not, I think that's the more political intrigue of the two. No, I I think I totally agree with that. Because we're talking about political intrigue, I know, right? Um, <laughs> as a genre. Yes. Of like literary and narrative genre, yeah. right? Because uh, your typical institutional engagement, as you've defined it as, can be really a, it's just an action movie. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go and just destroy the building, kill all the people, whatever, right? Mm-hmm. It's just an action sort of na- based narrative. Um, whereas if you, to get that certain feeling that that political intrigue has, mm-hmm. the story and the characters really need to be in the, in the weeds of, the, of that political system. Absolutely. And working within the confines of mm-hmm. the, the politics. And I'm sure we're going to talk about that. Yeah. I'm sure we're yeah. going to talk about that. Okay. Um, but as, I like it. As, that, 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 the, the difference that you've defined yeah, there is okay, good. Okay, okay, good. Yeah. So the last thing I want to leave you with here when I'm talking about power, right? Because this whole thing okay. has been talking about power and how we how we look at it and how we kind of view it as characters, uh, so on and so forth, or as world builders, right? As DMs as well. Mm-hmm. Is we have to name the game. It's the name not, of the game. Name of the game. Um, in order for there to be a power struggle, we need to have a prime foundation. So whatever the major point of intrigue or major point of contestation is going to be, we need to develop what that one kind of simple thread is that we're going to build everything around. Because when you when you do finally cut all the layers of the onion back and away, right, mm-hmm. there is that one kind of integral middle bit. That's, okay. Or maybe that's a bad uh, metaphor, whatever. There's a seed inside the apple, right, that you got to get to that mm-hmm. everything's growing around. Mm-hmm. It, I think in the purposes of world building, we do need to start simplified and then add layers until we're comfortable. So to, to say like, okay, let's break down our favorite story, our favorite vengeance paladin, right? John Wick. Yep. Right? I'm going to destroy you because you destroyed something that I love. Okay. Awesome. Great. Our power struggle is loss, right? Or vengeance or whatever. But this is, this is a power straight up tug of war. I'm going to inflict power on you. You're going to inflict power on me and we're going to push real hard, Mm -hmm. right? At its base core, that's what it is. Game of Thrones, same thing. Everybody's trying to get the Iron Throne. Mm -hmm. It is a power of seat. So when you say the prime foundation, are you talking about actual sort of physical desires and, and goals? This could be that step two, right? Define a need. Okay. Right? This organization, Uh remember last episode, Mm -hmm. this individual, this character, this NPC, this PC wants that, Mm -hmm. right? They don't want to give it up. Boom. That's that kind of pure. Right. But it's very concrete, right? It's it's less like uh, an idea like good versus evil. Yes. Right, less than less, not, not that. Not that. Okay. Not okay. That. That's more like a be, theme, I it guess. It should be something concrete, right? Okay. It should be a desire, a need, one of the goals, one of the motivations, mm-hmm. right? Like it should be one of those things that you can clearly identify. Oh, like like the 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 king. Who who who's gonna be the next king? The next ruler. Sure. Like everyone wants to be the next ruler. Sure. That's right. Okay. And then so you would yeah. draw a line in this case from the empty crown. Than to each of the suitors. Right. 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 And then we're going to add our okay. junk on top. Yeah. But, but that's a, the simplified. It's a, clear, it's a desire okay. for the crown. Okay. Boom. That's it. There is one. Make it one because it's going to get really complicated really quickly. Um, but if we can define their singular goal, that will help. Okay. Right. Um, and it's okay to be simplified at this point. Mm-hmm. Right. I mm-hmm. desire the crown. Boom. Done. We don't need to make it complicated because it will get more complicated because we do that anyway. Yes. Right? So at this point, when we're investing in our understanding of interaction with power, keep it simple. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to leave you with that. That kind of little tidbit to think on. I like the definition of power um, and, and the fact that like people, we all have that power, right? Mm-hmm. Just like how everyone... Oh, there, you watching has the power to hit that like and subscribe button for us. You do have that right? power. And the responsibility attached to that <laughs> to click on that like, subscribe, uh, and leave a comment. 
right? Yeah. Uh, so th- so that uh, you get more of us, we get more of you. You can find us on where all the major platforms, uh, YouTube podcasts. Uh, Sean six hundred fours are hungry. The, uh, right, the troops. The way to keep them boys fed, right, and girls. So uh, wonderful. Do your duty. Rise up and meet your <laughs> responsibilities. Rise up. Uh, and after you've done that, let's let's talk about political intrigue itself. Like, why why have political intrigue? Mm-hmm. Right. Like, if you don't have political intrigue, or maybe you want to have political intrigue, political intrigue, let's talk about uh, what is it about political intrigue that's so great, mm-hmm. right? Um, what you got that look? You got that look. You always mm-hmm. have that look. Uh, I'm using my eyes. Right? The No, your shirt is just folding up. It's a little up? bit of your belly when, oh, you, when you're reaching over. Oh, so I was like, ooh, hey, check hey, that. hey, See, hey, guys. Check that. Check hey guys. that. All right. We've already seen your nipple on this podcast. I know, right? You want to see more? Like and subscribe. <laughs> like and subscribe. <laughs> Jeez, this is the wrong platform. We got to switch platforms. Uh, okay. Uh, um, anyways, <laughs> political intrigue. What it does to a campaign. Yeah. Uh, number one, I think it adds... It immediately adds story depth. Immediately, because things get complex. You're setting a goal for depth. Yes. For sure you are. Right? Um, and it depends on, how, like, when we say a political intrigue campaign, it doesn't have to be, like, pure political Downton Abbey intrigue. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, where it's just talking and relationships and, and, and power struggles. Mm-hmm. Um you can it's on a, on the sliding scale right it can be 100% mm, it can be 10% like it can be mostly dungeon crawling with a little bit of intrigue right uh, but immediately if you add any political intrigue at all it it deepens your story okay it adds that complexity for sure to your storytelling um, immediately because it is political intrigue introduces a system of like hidden agendas power struggles, Mm -hmm. shifting alliances, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And because of that, it engages uh, your players and the viewers that are experiencing your campaign um, with that suspense and uncertainty, right? And that keeps them sort of eager to uncover the next twist in the story. (laughs) What a twist. Twist. M. Night Shyamalan is B. Right? Like, think about, think about, like, any of our modern day TV shows. The majority of them have political intrigue may not be like political in, in the sense of like nations and politics and politicians mm-hmm. political intrigue in the, in the way of sort of power mm-hmm. dynamics mm-hmm. right um, so immediately deeper storyline with political intrigues um, if you we all we, all, we talk about like we want to explore things like moral dilemmas in our story and stuff like that, right? Because it's things, something that we as humans sort of are really attracted to, I think. Um, so if we want to add that in our campaign, political intrigue will do that mm-hmm. by its nature, right? Because again, because of the different factions and different power plays, uh, it presents, again, this sort of web of ethical and moral dilemmas for the players to engage in or choose to engage in should they yeah. wish to. Yeah. Uh, and it forces them, the players, you, or your people at your table, to make those difficult decisions, right? And they're, typically there's no clear right or wrong answers. I think if you're, if you're doing it right, right, for, for the purpose of, of exploring more morality. If you're executing it correctly, there should yeah. be no right answer. No, it's usually... <laughs> Right. The and, least and wrong that's answers. why it's a moral dilemma. Yes. Right? Right. That's, that's that sacrifice right. portion of power. Right. And when you do that, really, it encourages that those discussions. That's where the exploration comes from, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and as a sort of result of that, you get character development, right? Because we all want to have character development. Mm-hmm. Straight up, you're going to have character development. Um, because... You're going to have to make those tough decisions and then consider the consequences of those actions and then deal with those consequences. Right. Right. Um, political intrigue also offers sort of varied challenges to your players. Mm. More mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. than your um, traditional dungeon crawling campaign. Because mm-hmm. really, typical dungeon crawling campaign is like, look, there are some orcs 
let's just slaughter them because they're standing in front of a treasure chest. Right? There's no <laughs> there's no questions, there's no power dynamics, right? It's just pure physical. I can kill you faster than you can kill me. Yes, which right? is the most basic power dynamic. Right. And it yeah. and that's fine too, if that's mm-hmm. what you're going for. But once you add the political intrigue part of it, mm-hmm. um, immediately it opens up their campaign to other sorts of challenges. They're orc right? activists <laughs> in front of a treasure chest. Right, for, for uh, orc rights. Yeah. Right? And the treasure chest is a manifesto. I don't know. Um, but immediately it requires... <laughs> <laughs> skills so brutal it's right. so brutal what's in the treasure chest just this book that's written really really poorly <laughs> what zug is- zug <laughs> uh, um, anyway they immediately your campaign requires uh, skills that are are immediately more important uh, for political intrigue stuff like diplomacy right uh, persuasion investigation all the subtlety ones that we only use to get better deals when we buy stuff, typically. Yeah, or lie detectoring. Or whatever, right, right. right? Yeah. Um, and again, it appeals to your players who enjoy more of the role-playing, negotiation, and problem-solving, uh, mm-hmm. in addition to your combat encounters. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, and these things will come naturally into your campaign because of the political intrigue. Um, I think lastly, I'm going to talk about it also. Um, political intrigue is great because it's so versatile. It's adaptable to any campaign setting and any theme. So if you don't have political intrigue yet in your campaign, you can add it in no matter what theme it is. Is, is it horror? Is it Ravenloft? You can add political intrigue. Is it um, space? Not space. What, what, they, what they call it? between the spheres? Spell jammering? Spell, you can, spell jammering, yeah. Right? Political intrigue. Underdark campaign. Political intrigue. Right? It's, is it modern day with fantasy elements? You can have political intrigue, right? It's a bunch of kids in an academy, political intrigue. It fits into any theme, any campaign. Um, post-apocalyptic, anything, right? I mean, just with that ax- asterisk there, right? As long as that fits within your session zero, or you've talked about, if you want straight dungeon crawl, murder, yes. homo, and whatnot. Yes. The political intrigue is not... Again, it's a spectrum, right? It is a spectrum. So if you want it, you can have it because it fits yes. in any campaign. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, and you can customize that political landscape to match any campaign, mm-hmm. any unique flavor you want. Mm-hmm. Right? If you want to make it silly, you can make it a silly political intrigue. If you want to make it more serious, you can make it more brutal, you can. It is open. It's, it's less of a, a theme and more of an execution a way of, being. of a genre. So yes. And that way it fits into anything. Yeah. It's like any movie as well. You can, you can, you can add political intrigue into it. It may not make it a better movie, <laughs> but you, but you can do it. Right. Yeah. Interesting. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I agree. So if, you, if you want political intrigue, you can do it, do it. Cause it's awesome actually. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I would also like to say um, just in the idea of it being a spectrum, if there is too much, and you're losing the mm. plot, you're losing what's going on, there's right. too much cloak and dagger, and you're, you're getting lost, um, feel free to kind of call a halt as well and be like, hey, can we dial this down or can we like talk about this? Because oh, I'm, I'm yeah. getting lost in, in how much is going on. This is getting too convoluted, too many plot lines are crisscrossing, and I don't mm-hmm. know what I'm doing anymore, right? Have that conversation. Well, you can slower the focus. Lo- yeah. Right? Because political intrigue works across that spectrum. Correct. 10 to 100, right? Yeah. Well, 0 to 100, I guess. 0 to 100, yeah. yeah. Um, yes. So make sure that you uh, get it right because you can dial it in. Yeah. Right? Up and no. down, right? Yeah, it's true because for me personally, too much political, political intrigue, I find it super annoying. Sure. I like I like a certain amount. Yeah. Right? But I do also like the action and, and the combat as well in there. Of course. Cool. And then just some like happy tavern time. Right? Yeah. Filled with political intrigue. It's so <laughs> awesome. Um, right? It's, it's the, the tavern keep versus the, the kitchen workers. Uh, uh, right? oh. And the merchants. All oh. these different factions. I and, just, then, and then the people who come in. To, wanted to, a pint. To, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, too much. It's too much. Uh, no, what? You want mead? Do you understand hilarious. what that means in this tavern? That's hilarious. <laughs> All right. We know what power is. We now know why it's good yep. to add in political entry, why it's good to add that in there, and how it can bolster your game. Let's, let's zoom way out. 
to a concept that I don't know. Let's let's make a metaphor for this. I'm gonna call this Death Stars and Yavin Fours. Star Wars are going there. Yeah, okay. Going all the way out, and and mostly yes, I know it's the moon of Yavin Four. Don't at me, uh, or do <laughs> jump in the comments and at no, me do for it. being like, totally yeah, do good it. job. Uh, also, Alderaan, which we'll get to in a moment. But uh, this is where I think now that we've talked about <laughs> the basis of power, what power is, okay. how we're interacting with it, how our organizations are viewing it, how we're setting up that single threat. Mm-hmm. Okay, much like the Death Star laser. If you recall in the movies, mm-hmm. right, there's one laser that blows up Alderaan. Mm-hmm. But as they commence primary Is ignition... Is it a laser? Anyways, whatever. It's a super laser, technically. A super laser. But around the dish, there's all those separate beams that collect into the middle before that kind of killing blow. Yeah, just three. No, it's like six. Is it six? There's, yeah, it's all the way around. Whoa. Well, get in the comments. Say, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm guessing six. Okay. Three is no. Is in this remastered? I don't know. Anyways, let yeah. us know. Let no, us know. No. And we're not talking Star Killer based. No, uh, original. Yeah, I don't know. Anyways, <sighs> episode let's not, four. Let's not talk about that one. So, this is this metaphor of all those smaller lasers coming together before the one kind of major stroke. Okay. This is where we're <laughs> going to add intrigue to the game, right? So mm-hmm. this is the intrigue part of political intrigue. Um, now that we have a clear understanding of that one big power struggle. Okay. Okay. We're going to break it down into the facets, right? Or those separate parts that come together to push forward that desire. Okay. That goal in, in this um, contest or whatever okay. it is that we're trying to accomplish. Okay? And what the intrigue itself. Okay. Yes. So I'm going to say we're going to commence primary intrigue, not ignition. And we're going to dig into this. So we alluded to it before. These are probably words that you have encountered before and i hope you know what they mean if not we're going to talk about it anyway but i'm going to start with hard power hard Hard power um (laughs) hard power these are you can think of these as um like attack vectors or these are resources or these are different ways that we can influence that that kind of individual or prime intrigue towards its goal. Okay. Okay. These are what the powers are. So these are the separate parts that we're using to support our kind of major intrigue, our major goal, that single thread. So of course the simplest, like we talked about before with our adventurers going in and killing the orcs, there is physical Physical power. Yeah. Okay. This is the ability to exert control through physical force This could also be military force or just combat strength, Mm -hmm. right? This is how bad I can hurt you, okay? Yes. Economic power is also another type of hard power where my influence and control over wealth, resources, and financial systems. Okay. This is how much cash I have, how much gold I have, how much I can buy, right? I can can physically change the world, hard power, right? Something tangible, um, in order to push my goal along, in order to force mm-hmm. my my mm-hmm. kind of my political yep. intrigue to be a stronger or have a stronger basis for it to push forward to destroy my target or gain my target, whatever it is, right? Might, money. Third one, political power. Now, political power is the authority that I have derived from being a governor or being an officer or being kind of remember that kind of. Um, rigid authority that we talked about mm-hmm. before, right? That I can use to make and enforce perhaps laws or I can influence public policy. This is power of my office that I can change the world around me. Right? Okay. Right. In, in not feudal Japan, but in like <laughs> kind of, uh, when, when was it kind of the early 1900s when they just said no more swords in Japan, you cannot oh, wear a sword. Right. Yeah. And the military is going to enforce this. I, the emperor, am writing this into law. Yeah. No more samurais, right? No more samurais, no more swords, right? Yeah. Uh, and they didn't say no more samurais, but they just said you can't carry a sword. Yes. Right. As, as that was one of their symbols. Mm-hmm. Right. And the military is going to take that away. I can do that because I have the political power to change the laws. Okay. Okay. This is another example of force, right? Because that political power would extend to physical power and it makes you do things. Mm -hmm. Coercive power is an interesting one, but this is yet another facet of how we can affect 
hard power changes. Now, coercive power is the capacity uh, to compel compliance through threats or the use of force. So this is, right, yeah, mm -hmm. this is the gangster coming around your shop, you know, charging you for a window washing fee, in quotations. Okay. Right? Because if you don't, I will exert things upon you that you do not want or your family does not want or whatever, right? But this is a coercion not through um, kind of a rumor or a feeling or whatnot. This is me with a threat of physical force for you to change your mind. I'm going to compel compliance. It's what interesting. I, want. I feel like political power and coercive power are like derivations of more base, more base prime hard powers like physical power and economic power. They're they're different applications there. Yeah. Anyways, right? okay. okay. And 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 we'll talk about kind of mingling these as well because okay. they okay. none of them exist in an island, right? They're all mm, kind of mm -hmm. a, once again a spectrum of interaction. Yes. But the yes. the kind of common thread to these is that they all have a physical um, manifestation. No, yeah, manifestation. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, so coercion, changing your mind through compliance, uh, force compliance, networks and alliances. Um, this is stemming strength between the connections and relationships and the alliances that you have. So pay the gold price to get your merchant license or none of the shops in our merchant alliance will buy from you. Oh, well, you're all merchant alliance. I'd have to go another 50 miles to sell to a store that doesn't. Well, that's your choice. Mm -hmm. Pay the fee or you don't get to sell. Yep. Right. Me and my buddies, we have a deal. That yes, we're going to extort you and make you pay this outrageous fee just to sell your stuff here. It doesn't matter if you're getting okay prices. We're just going to drain it of the back end. It's right? a good derivation of course of power. <laughs> it is a derivation yeah. of that. Yes. Um, but that can also work. You know, in real life, we had like NATO versus the Warsaw Pact. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like we have a bunch of countries that say if you attack one of us, you attack all of us. And, not, and you can't fight all of us. So mm -hmm. the other side's like, okay, well, we're going to do that too. If you attack any of us, you attack all of us. So we're going to fight yeah. you, right? And so you you make bigger and bigger and bigger teams that kind of have this mutual destruction. Yeah, like and embargoes you, and sanctions. But you can't and, do yeah. anything, right? Because now that's there's no like fight between you and me. Mm -hmm. It's a fight between all of us versus all of you, right? right. It's not this like it's not this schoolyard fist fight anymore. It's it's, it's, it's gangs. It's, it's gangs. Gang fighting. It's armies. Yeah. It's, yeah. Um, and then last, which is kind of interesting as kind of a, a hard power, I think is, is knowledge and expertise. This is the influence from specialized knowledge that you can have in a particular field. Hmm. So this is probably the closest to soft power. But once again, this is, I know how to fireball. And your town meeting is, is really kind of, uh, well, it looks kind of flammable over there, right? So this is a derivation of coercion. Right. Right. I, I know how to do things. Perhaps I know how to do things that you need. I know how to mill your wheat right into flour. I know how to make it rain. And you guys have been in a drought for like two I know how years to make it now. Stop raining. Oof. Too, right? Right. And like, I'm not coursing you in anything, but you need me. No, I'm specialized. I'm the only yeah. person who can do this. I'm the only person that yeah. can help you, or I'm the only person that can continue to hinder you. Oh, did I say continue? Oops. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so now these are all physical manifestation things, right? These are all yep. things you can do in ways that you can affect the world physically. So like I said before, whether you want to consider these attack vectors or these are ways of influencing mm -hmm. the intrigue or the plot, if you're building a plot, these are all the physical ways that you can adjust the story or adjust the world to kind of set the initial chessboard, mm -hmm. right? Soft power is the opposite. Soft power is that invisible thing. That kind of compels you to do stuff. Right. Right? Yep. So in this case, a couple couple versions of soft power. Stick with me. I know this is a lot all at once. It's really high level too. Yeah. Uh, social power. This is <laughs> social proof. Remember that bad boy from a little while ago? It's super effective. But this is, this is influence gained through status, reputation, and charisma within society or community. So... Not everybody necessarily likes Gaston. No, they don't. Gaston's the best. Gaston's the best at everything. Everybody loves Gaston. Right. Right. He, he isn't a terrible person 
he's a to the town he's a terrible person from our perspective yes in, yes right he has developed that charisma that reputation right that he can't be touched yeah right um this is a not that's not hard power he's no better or worse than any other person well, he is very strong. But he, he is. <laughs> no one lifts like Gaston. <laughs> right. Um, and moving Do you even lift Gaston? <laughs> he does. He does. He does. You moving, have protein. Moving through the social, right, that pushes into the cultural power, right? And this is the ability to change cultural values, beliefs, and norms. Mm. Now, normally, this would be associated with my next one, which is religious power. Right, bringing in a faith, bringing in a set of moral and ethical values to then change. This is what the missionaries did in you, our you world, right. right? Changing the values, changing the cultural, changing the beliefs and norms. When you do that, hey, look, we're going to bring in a mining guild mm-hmm. to this poor town because we see that you have a fresh silver vein. And we're going to start and we're going to give you lots of money. So now all of a sudden, kind of rural individuals now are flush with cash Mm -hmm. and they don't know what to do with it. So everything starts going up in price and it's crazy one, but you've now changed the norm from not being able to have anything to being able to have everything. Okay. Right. Is that good? Is that bad? Mm -hmm. It's not anything yet, but it is a form of power. Yep. Right. Right? We're changing what the norm is. Mm -hmm. Right. Maybe then you become, you know, mayor and then all of a sudden you raise taxes. And then you take right. all that money that the town is flush with and you redeposit it back in your pocket. And you're mm-hmm. like, okay, great. I gave it to you, made the deal, but now I get it all back. In right. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> information. Now, this is information itself, not the ability to be specialized or knowledgeable in it, but this is that secret. This is that blackmail esque thing. Oh, yeah. Right? That isn't a physical. <laughs> blackmail, not. That is, it's not like a yeah. physical thing. I can't send my thug to beat blackmail into you. But I can deliver, I can use him to deliver the message that like, right. hey, do you want this secret to come out? Right? This is not a physical thing. This is an intangible secret. Right? Yeah. This is word of yeah. mouth, rumor, whatever. But it can change your point of view. Mm-hmm. It can change your compliance to what's going on. It can influence it can spread my influence so I get what I want in the world. Yes. Yeah. Um, legitimacy is another interesting soft power. Mm. So this is, this is the whole hullabaloo in, in Game of Thrones, right? Who has the bloodline to take the Iron Throne? Who is right. who's a usurper? Who's a, 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 a bastard? Who mm-hmm. is a pure blood? Who is in the family tree? How does the family tree stack up? Mm-hmm. Right, you can look at that in, in real life in the British monarchy, right? And just all the shuffling that people do. Right. Every time there's a baby or somebody abdicates or somebody moves mm-hmm. on, somebody mm-hmm. marries out. There's this list hundreds deep we track. Yes. Because it has some relevance. Right. Right. And so we know that this claim is more legitimate than that claim, but they're the same claim. We mm-hmm. just know that one's more legitimate, one's more believable, one's more kind of uh, persuading. Right? Well, it's like pizza, right? What's a real pizza? Mm. Is pineapple or no pineapple? Is it a legitimate pizza or is it not a legitimate pizza? If they're both sort of specific types of bread with cheese and sauce yes, and stuff on top. Yes, it's the exact same thing until we get to that one ingredient, but, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. And it's at, it's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a debate. There's yes. a power struggle on pizza, on pizza with pineapples or not. Right. Right. So it's... Interesting legitimacy. Legitimacy is a sort of soft power. I don't know if you've considered it or not, right? But this is one of the things that we can talk about. So soft power is the capacity to sway and persuade others through attraction, culture, and diplomacy, Mm. rather than that physical coercion. Well, I think it's also important to note that just because you call it soft power doesn't mean it's less powerful than hard power. Absolutely not. Sometimes it's more powerful. Yes. Right? Yes. And, and, and so when we've now looked at, I don't know what this is, like a dozen different versions of mm-hmm. power, these are all ways that you can add into your campaign uh, or world or kind of small town or mm-hmm. whatever it is to influence what is happening as people are interacting with that power for the struggle that they're, that mm-hmm. main line that they are kind of focused on, right? How can we tweak these up and down? How can they excuse me, tweak these up and down to further their cause. Can they make themselves seem more legitimate to take the new town council seat? Mm-hmm. Right? Oh, I've lived here longer. I've been with the people longer. 
I pay more taxes. My claim is more legitimate than this new guy who just moved to town. Right. But he's fancy and everybody loves him, but I'm one of you. I'm more legitimate. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. No, that is something. Right. That is something. You you know our lives. You know our mm-hmm. fight more. Mm-hmm. So this, this is kind of hard and soft. So this is all those little beams around the dish that are joining together to focus in kind of one big shot. Yeah. Now, when we talk about hard power, we talk about soft power, like you said, they're all kind of equivalent in their own ways, mm-hmm. right? Or maybe one's greater than the other, depending on the context of your scenario. This is where we have to talk about smart power. Now, smart power is combining these elements. Okay. Taking a little bit from here, a little bit from there, a derivation from here, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And combining it into kind of a customized package for what you're attempting to do. Now, yep. now we spoke about this a little bit previously when we talked about organizations, but this is how they move forward in their goals. What, yes. What can they pull just from that. their resources, from mm-hmm. their um, assets, from their personnel, from their allies? What mm-hmm. can they put together to push them forward towards their goal, right? Yeah. This is what smart power is. Dumb power is obviously the opposite. Dumb power is... is Don't use any of it. <laughs> well, dumb power is, you know, barbarians attacking the Senate. Mm. Right? And you're not changing the laws. You're trying to burn down and kill the people that make them. Right. Right? So you're not going to affect proper change. All you're going to do is galvanize people and, like, force them to fight the barbarians. It's not the way to get them to be able to be citizens or whatever it is. Whatever right. your story is telling. Yeah. Right? Um, versus soft power is not sitting down for tea when the other army is lined up and charging you. Okay. Yeah. Right? These are things that don't apply in those particular scenarios. Once you've gotten to certain places, you've painted yourselves into corners of things you can use and things you can't use. Right. And that's where you're customizing the package of power that you want to use to then shoot it out and influence mm-hmm. the world around. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> when we're thinking about this, we got to think of different types of versions of this that we've seen, right? So when we're combining these things, Game of Thrones, right, is such a great example of people using soft power and hard power all the time, intermingled with each other. All of the different storylines that are going on are using combinations of them to do the smartest moves that they believe they can. But ultimately, that game breaks down to either you win or you die. Right? Cersei says <laughs> yes. when you play the Game of Thrones, you either win or you die. Yeah. Right? Uh, conversely, going from kind of, I don't want to call it necessarily high epic fantasy, but let's call it fantasy. You can go back to like rom-coms and heartthrob movies. Like she's all that. That is, that is a political intrigue of soft power pushing on the hierarchy of a high school yes. to turn an outcast and a nerd into prom queen. Yes. I never watched that movie, but I, I do now understand what it's about. Right. (laughs) Janie gets bullied. Janie gets ostracized. Janie gets pushed out. Janie gets all of these things happen, but then someone with political power comes, starts spreading or starts countering rumors, Mm -hmm. does the glow up, does the kind of, you know, um, shift in that person's not personality, but in her physical attraction and all this kind of stuff. And turns out that she was who we didn't think she would, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, blah, yeah, blah right. Yeah. It's the ugly duckling, beautiful swan right. kind of thing. Right. Hmm. But that is an example of a political intrigue. If you want it to be. Yes. Right? It's interesting. Okay. And that's not army smashing against each other. That's not gold. Being right. spent yeah, that's not, yeah. Army smashing is not, but it yeah. is soft power playing against each other. Mm-hmm. This is a change in the values and the norms of that high school. This is playing with all of those sorts of things, right? So, so like you said, and to reiterate this point, it can fit into any story that you want it to, right? It does fit. And if you don't recognize it, you're probably not looking for it, Mm -hmm. but it's there. Yeah. It's there. Oh yeah. And, and so to kind of finish out this section, I think people will, people, I don't know, some people, people, those people, people, I've heard people say the best people, uh, not the best people. Not the best people. Oh, no, the worst people. We'll say, well, just install like a rock, paper, scissors system. Okay. Right. Oh, power, whatever. Power wipes out weapons. Weapons wipe out money. Money wipes out power. Right. Rock, paper, scissors. Okay, cool. It's simple in comparison. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's boring. Mm-hmm. Right? It can be a starting place for you if you want. 
But using that kind of one always dominates the other, always dominates the other, always dominates the first. Kind of that cyclical hierarchy mm-hmm. to keep things in balance. I think that that's a great place for you and your system to get abused by the players. Because they'll figure out having all of one and enough of the second is enough to get them through. They don't have to like really play. They don't have to sacrifice. They don't have to get into the intrigue parts of what you're trying to do, what you're trying to explore. If we have enough force and a little bit of coin, yeah, we don't have to worry about anything else. We'll just do it. We'll force it to happen. It's okay. I think it depends on how you do it. I mean, it feels like, because if you have rock, paper, scissors, uh, if you think of it as a sort of dynamic um, sort of system of power that's always pushing against each other, mm-hmm. um, then it's much harder to abuse. Because if you're like, all I'm going to get is rock, right? And the paper will roll you over, mm-hmm. right? Oh, I'm, all I'm going to get is paper then. Well, there's, then there's the scissors. Mm-hmm. Um, if you think of it as that sort of constant pressure in balance, I mean, that's why it's, the intrigue is happening because no one can just win on its own, mm-hmm. right? Um, then it's much harder to abuse. Then you have to start balancing stuff and making those deals. And, right. right. Um, anyways, maybe just a different way of Well, and that's, that's why I that. said it, it doesn't make it boring. It is a good place to start. Yes. Right. right? When you're dealing with a few options kind of grinding against each mm-hmm. other, that is good. That's great. That's a way that you build in confidence and build in ability mm-hmm. when you're starting to do these sorts yep. of things to then create these higher webs with a dozen different facets and all this mm-hmm. other stuff going on, right? Um, I'm just kind of citing the example of you don't need a dozen facets to each one of your oh, entries. No. Yeah. You're going to overload, right? Mm-hmm. This is, mm-hmm. remember when I said keep it simple at the beginning? This is why. is because as you start talking about Okay, this particular line has these five. This one has these seven. Oh, my God. This one has three. Oh, these yeah. are four, right? It starts to go exponentially mm-hmm. greater in the amount of prep, the amount of understanding, the amount of weaving that you have to do. So don't make it too simple, I think, is, is the key, mm-hmm. right? Because it can get abused very easily. But also watch um, when you are building, when you're becoming more comfortable with these things, that you don't overload yourself. Mm-hmm. So there is no right or wrong answer, I suppose, is what I'm yeah. going to say to this, right? And and your kind of recontextualization of just one wipes out the next, wipes out the yeah. other, is a great, great restatement, mm-hmm. right? These are constantly in flux, grinding against the other, pushing forward, pushing the yeah. others to kind of keep yeah. up. It's an arms race. It's a whatever. Um, yes. Because all three are always in play anyway. You're right. Like like scissors are always trying to push against paper and trying to sort of keep the rocks at bay. Yes. Right. And and that's what they're all doing to, in different ways, right? Yeah. To each other. So you can't. I th- I feel like when you're setting up a political entry campaign, that sort of has to be the default setting, anyways. And then it's the players that come in that change the balance. Yeah. Anyways, it's it's definitely a great place to start. Yeah. It's definitely a great place um, to start. And. No, yeah, talking about like, I like what you're talking about with a soft and hard power and all the different ways that you can do it. Um, Because it's it's a great list to use when you're sort of building those factions within your political intrigue, Mm -hmm. right? Like this is, this faction uses this kind of hard power and this kind of Mm -hmm. soft power in general, right? And this is their their smart power package, Mm -hmm. right? And different factions will have different packages that you're talking about. And you should, you should like with an asterisk or in, in quotations, if you have all 12 or however many there were, right, and you're building a town that you want to have a mm-hmm. country, each one of them should be in play somewhere, somehow yeah. playing on that kind of spectrum once again. But there there should be somebody who kind of specializes or mm-hmm. utilizes in that smart power package. Yeah. Like at least, well, all of them should be in play in some combination. Well, you can see that in all the different characters in uh, Game of Thrones. They each have their own sort of customized power package that they use. Yeah. Right. To try to gain that. Yeah. That throne of, of swords. Yeah. Coming back from the dead is, is not, I don't know which one that would be. It's power, power of miracles. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of miracles, um, if you have made it this far, it's without, a miracle <laughs> without being. <laughs> so thanks for that. And why don't you hit that like subscribe button? Uh, come join us for and that's this. Our and, miracle. And every other. Yeah. Be uh, that's one down. You only have to do two more. To become a saint in the Catholic Church. (laughs) 
that's one one down if you just right. like subscribe jump in the uh, comments let us know um i don't know what um what's your personal smart oh, package smart power smart package power? Oh, as yeah. a person that's interesting because we all do too or your current character what is your current character's oh. generalized smart power loadout i want to know you you specifically oh, you? yeah <laughs> tell us about you <laughs> Uh no, it's 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 wicked. It's because we talk about smart power and 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 sort of all these things that go into building sort of a like a political faction. Mm-hmm. Um, they're also really I think useful when we talk about building our as players our personal political faction, which is our character. Yes, right. Because as PCs uh, and players playing in a political intrigue campaign, I think. Uh, you are very much, you and your party, I guess, are very much uh, a faction on your own. Can be. Right. Well, no, f- for for sure, I think. Um, just like, because um, if you're going to engage in that political, you're you're doing your thing. You might join up with other factions and work with. You are your you're always uh, in in TTRPs and in, in D and D five E speci- like specifically. I think um, the players are a force unto themselves. Um, narratively, therefore, within the genre, I think you are a particular, unique faction uh, okay. on the same level as gods, as we talked about in the deities, right? In, in the oh, previous okay. organization, you're, uh, the organization. You're, you're your own very unique organization. Yeah. Okay. Um, anyways, um, and because of that, I think when you're going to build a character, like you want to play in a political entry campaign you do right? you do you do so when you're building your character um, I think it's good to think about how specifically you can build your character to be quote unquote I guess I don't know successful in a political intrigue yeah. campaign not necessarily optimized or, or right. winning because I don't yeah. know exactly what that means but to sort of lean into that political intrigue flavor the yeah. genre yeah right um, so you're not just Jack Thock, the barbarian who just howls and hits things with his head. <laughs> Only right? doors. <laughs> right? Because it, it doesn't... Anyways. Uh, Jack Thock. Yeah, good old Jack Thock. We don't talk about Jack Thock No. Enough. This is the first time we've talked about Jack Thock on the, on the podcast. Yeah. Um, but anyways, maybe he'll come out later. Oh. Yeah, he's great. Um, all right, so, <laughs> so you're building a character for, in a political intrigue campaign, right? Um, first thing I'm talking about is the crunch. All the mechanics stuff. I'm not going to go deep into this. Because oh, okay. it's straightforward. I'll let you guys do sort of optimized builds for this, but it's like talking about backgrounds, right? Any, mm-hmm. any background works, but the obvious choice is noble, courtier, spy. Inheritor. Right, stuff like that, right? Yeah. Um, skills, persuasion, deception, insight, history, languages are probably way more valuable in a political intrigue campaign than, in, than, uh, in, than not. Can we go back one sec? Okay. Just quickly on backgrounds. Mm-hmm. We often talk about changing the game and the system flavor wise mm. to reflect the personality of our character. Yeah. Right. So what kind of noble are you? What, mm-hmm. what, what court did you exist in? What were the ethics, the morals, the values, right? Why are you different? Why are you specialized? What is your smart power that you get out of being a reflavored noble? Mm hmm in the mechanics of it, in the crunch of it, yeah. to further exemplify well, and what And hopefully you're you've doing. gotten like a, some sort of primer package for all the different factions and stuff like that sure. that sort of exists in, in, the, in, in the campaign so you can sort of build around that. Or if your DM doesn't, say, hey, can I build one? Yeah, yeah. Right? Um, don't just necessarily, ex- what I'm saying is don't just necessarily accept it as it is. Yes. Um, well, to be honest, I never uh, use the, the pre-written Backgrounds. I always do custom ones. Sure. Anyways. Sure. Because it's, it's way cooler that way. <laughs> <laughs> but, but just saying it says fireball. It doesn't mean that it's, you know, this or that yeah. or whatever. You make your fireball. So you make your background fit it in there. Right. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. I didn't want yeah. to interrupt you, but I think it's interesting. Right. Don't take it for granted. Right. Just keep my hot lyrics on my mixtape. Fireball. It's that hot. Oh. <laughs> right. That's he's a, he, he's a lyrical wizard, room. guys. Uh, anyways. Backgrounds, <laughs> skills, um, and then don't forget that you're probably still an adventuring party. 
right? So exploration and combat is still important. So don't talk about it in session zero. Right, exactly, right? Because you're you're probably not a hundred percent again, Downton Abbey political intrigue. Even aristocrats had to learn how to duel. Right? Mm-hmm. So uh, don't forget about the combat, the mechanics, like those crunches. Right. And again, it depends on the focus of the campaign. Yeah. Right. Uh, is it more political, not political? Anyways, that's the crunch. Not going to talk about it. Oh, it's quick crunch. Yeah. Because uh, that's not what makes makes it, I think. I think one of the main things um, when you're building a character for a political entry campaign is uh, to figure out your character motivations and goals. Huge, huge, huge. Right? Tiger like, blood. At least 16 inches. Huge. Uh, so you want to <laughs> at least 16 inches, ladies huge, and gentlemen. Huge. Like That's inhumanly huge. Um, when you're talking about goals, uh, think specific and achievable goals for your characters um, in during character creation, right? 16. So ensure that your character's goals are uh, clear um, and they're very specific so you know exactly what it is and they're achievable within that context of the campaign. Inches. Right? I don't know if 16 is achievable. Um, maybe it's with magic. Clear. And large, clear. <laughs> large person. Uh, whether it's acquiring, like your, your goal is acquiring a specific title or exposing corruption, gaining a specific, specific amount of influence for something, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, when you're creating the character, make sure you um, set goals uh, that are tied to that political landscape mm-hmm. specifically. So hopefully you've, you've got that primer package, mm-hmm. right? It'll help you. Well, and each of, each of those things that you just mentioned are great as that kind of primary foundational threat, mm-hmm. right? I want to expose corruption in the blank. Yep. Great. That's the goal, right? Mm-hmm. It wants to hide corruption within itself. Yeah. Awesome. That's what I'm fighting. Against. Well, exactly, right? Super easy, super simple. Right. When it comes to objectives, I want to talk about, figure out sort of short-term mm-hmm. objectives and long-term ones. Like maybe 16 inches or more. Uh, so you want to define both of those for your objectives for your character, right? It's a big uh, book. So short-term <laughs> objectives would be uh, things that would drive your character's immediate actions. Remember our session goals? Right? Immediate actions. What I'm going to do in this session. Yep. Right? Long-term goals give your character that sense of long-term direction and purpose throughout the campaign. Mm-hmm. Right? So short-term, it's like maybe this specific section of the story of the, of the adventure long term is once i get this and i finish it i'm pretty much at the end yeah right so yeah once you have those because that'll inform so much of your rp and not exactly how you're rp but your rp decisions well and if you're right? an organization right the mm-hmm. long-term goal of where they want to be easy to establish the short term what do we need to do to work towards that mm-hmm. easy to establish yeah. Yeah. Right. Even if, like, we talk about organizational turns being a week of in game time or whatever. It right. Is, right. Yeah. Because they're not necessarily getting it every session. Mm-hmm. But we're not just talking about necessarily a PC, but a PC organization. Right. Or the faction of the PC mm-hmm. that you mentioned before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I um, mean, then the next thing I would set is alignment and morality. Start thinking about that. There are issues with alignment when it comes to 5e. We have like an entire episode dedicated to that, I think. Episode 10. Is that, geez, you didn't know the number. Um, I was wearing a red sweater. Jeez. Mm, I remember silly things. <laughs> I don't remember at all. I just. Silly things. I do these and I just erase them from my RAM. Um, but alignment specifically. Because <laughs> uh, anyways, because you RAM. Um, in politically charged campaigns, right? Characters will need to navigate situations. Um, that challenge their alignment. Yes. It will. Oh, yeah. Right? In a political entry campaign. So set your alignment and be ready to have that challenge, right? It's that compliance. Yes. Think about it ahead of time before you start actually playing, right? Mm-hmm. How rigid is your character alignment? Emphasis. <laughs> will their alignment change over the course of the campaign? Do you want it to? Ooh, great questions. Right? Like maybe yeah. I want them to have, maybe they're a total sort of chaotic force of selfishness. Mm -hmm. Maybe my personal direction is I want them to grow to become more virtuous and blah, 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 Mm -hmm. right? Think about that. Think about how rigid it is. Like, they believe that a lying is horrible and they'll never 
lie. Think about it. Will they never lie? Is there a point in which they might lie? Right. And we get into those moral flexibilities and yep. gray areas. Yep. When, it, when, when, when once we hit that point, right? And they um, never shrink, right? They, you can never they, go back. You can never. Yeah. You tell one lie, you're a liar. Mm-hmm. You can never not be you a cheat liar. Once you're a cheater, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, and because moral uh, political intrigue so often involves navigating those moral gray areas, be prepared for it. Yeah. Right. Um, so. Again, be prepared to make those difficult in-character decisions. What would they lie for? Right. Right? What is, more, what is more important than their morals? Yeah, think about that. Yeah. Set it before you head in, right? Yeah. Um, I think I know where you're going with this. <laughs> right? Uh, like, where will they comprom- promote, compromise their, their moral standards for the sake of achieving their goal yeah. or maintaining their position? Yeah. Right? Now, think about... Like, again, how far they're willing. Where is their line when it comes to achieving their goals? When do the, 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 the ends justify the means? Mm-hmm. Right? You grease the hinges, Sean. Open the door. Right? Yeah. I, right? I think I know what's going next. Um, next. Oh, yeah, do you? I think so. Okay. Yeah. Well, because if you, if, you have, if you have something that's worth, like, when the ends justify the means that means that the mean is an extreme it is now not necessarily a power this could be a vulnerability or a weakness. yes uh, okay absolutely yes. the next part is flaws and vulnerabilities yes these are the opposites that yep. we didn't talk about yeah to power but yes vulnerabilities um and when you're building a character in whether it's politically uh charged campaigns or not you want to put this anyways but specifically when it is political intrigue, you want to put these in there. Yes. Um, again, you want to add character depth through the flaws that you set. Well, if you right? don't, the DM will. Right? Yeah. Well, exactly, right? They'll, f- they'll a nice they'll backstory cr- you got. Right? They'll find a vulnerability. Right? About so, nine. the ball is in your court. Make sure it's going in the direction that you want it to go. So right. choose those flaws and vulnerabilities. Yes. Add that depth to your character beforehand. Yes. Right? Because... DMs have enough on, on their plate. They'll, they will take that low-hanging fruit that you've given them. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, also, they know that that's what you want. So, of course. Right? Mm-hmm. So, is it a, a fear? Is it past trauma? A weakness in their political understanding? Anything. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, imperfections in your characters create opportunities for your characters to grow. Right? And they, they provide for engaging storytelling. Mm-hmm. Um, well, even, even when we're looking at organizations and asset, mm-hmm. only an asset because you have enough or a lot of it. Yeah. What happens if you don't? What happens if you don't have your gold? What happens if you don't have your NPC workforce? Mm-hmm. What happens if you don't, right? That's no longer an asset. Right. Can my particular brand of power also be my particular brand of vulnerabilities? Correct. Right. right? I'm only strong as long as this mine is open. Mm-hmm. Right. But the mine's next to a river. And if the river <laughs> right. floods it, I'm SOL. Right. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, so when building characters, for a political intrigue campaign, yeah. consider adding those exploitable flaws. Exploitable flaws. You're putting those on purpose, right? Mm-hmm. For the sake of the intrigue, right? Because we want intrigue. Mm-hmm. We want to make it so that uh, our player or characters are sort of uh, fertile grounds to produce intrigue mm-hmm. from them. And flaws, vulnerabil- vulnerabilities, perfect ways of doing that. Um, so why would you, why would you do that? It's so, it's so scary. I don't want like, why would I put like combat flaws? It's different, right? Because character flaws and are specifically important because they allow for that RP, right? Mm -hmm. You want those flaws to be exploitable by the other characters or the other factions in the political landscape. Mm -hmm. That's what makes it interesting. Mm -hmm. Intrigue, right? Um, it also and, allows hooks. Yes. They're interesting hooks, subplots, right? Mm-hmm. For conflicts, because you, you need conflicts, mm-hmm. right? Or else the bar will just steamroll over everything. Can. Right. Well, or, or it helps develop kind of bonds between your PCs or between your mm-hmm. your faction. And it just makes your character less of a Mary Sue. Yeah. Right. And it makes that journey, that character journey, way more captivating because no one yeah. gives a crap about Mary Sue's eventually. Right. Um, and then, well, mm. yeah, 
Yeah, I think so. No crabs. No crabs. Uh, they give them all away to the to the people who have flaws. Just caffeine and cantrip. No crap. Mm, so much crap. Two hours of crap coming your way. Hot air. Um, lastly, oh. um, work set up in game relationships. Oh, I just said that. Awesome. Yeah. No, that's yeah. great. That's great. Right. In game relationship. Intra party relationships. Inter or intra? Intra. Oh. Within the party. Oh. Uh, so not not within inter parties, but within a party. Intra. Okay. Parties. Okay. So your other characters. Yes. Other PCs. Intra party relationships. Is that inter? No, it's intra because within inter is, will be between, between several Between two parties? parties? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So inter character parties, inter PC interactions is yeah. intra party interactions. Oh. You heard it here. There you go. Uh, so at, at character generation, develop those relationships with, uh, with within your adventuring party with other players. Right. Yes. Um, in a way that has relevant relevance to the political intrigue that okay. you sort of want to produce, because um, it'll the relationships that you set here will influence your character's decisions, their alliances, uh, and even the co- the type of conflicts that they'll sort of fall into. Um, it enriches it'll enrich your, your the narratives that you guys have, and again adds depth to your party dynamics. Right. Right. Because then you know what you think about those other party members. Yeah. Before going into it. Yeah. Um, you can also set up uh, NPC relationships and alliances beforehand. I know we like to have um, when we do our campaigns um, to set those uh, three, at least three different type of NPCs, right? Mm-hmm. The positive, neutral, and the negative NPC mm-hmm. that's related to your character. So create those NPCs, um, keeping in mind political intrigue, mm-hmm. right? So. Um, now we also, we also do, um, you know, come up with one or two bonds within the party, mm-hmm. right? And if you're going into specifically a political intrigue campaign, mm-hmm. you make a political intrigue bond. Yes. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and do the same thing with those NPCs, right? Uh, so create those NPCs that align with your character's goals that you set previously. Of course. Right. Or maybe they don't, maybe they oppose it. Of course. Right. Set alliances. Both. Friendships yep. or rivalries with influential figures spies or diplomats yep. or any other character that that's mm-hmm. in within the intrigue mm-hmm. right or even servants right because they're they're always a part of political intrigue um because these connections what it no what they sense. are are no basically they're powerful tools <laughs> uh, for the dm yeah right? they'll use them to provide the party with uh, valuable information support Right, opportunities for interesting role play within yep. that political sphere. Yep. Because um, it's so much harder for DM to sort of just bait hooks and just wait for you to yeah, wait for you to, to bite and maybe. Um, but if you give those hooks already, those pre-bitten hooks. Pre-bitten hooks. Pre-bitten hooks oh. at character ge- generation for your DM. And they're like, oh, great. Now I can craft something truly artistic and compelling because I've got all of these hooks. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. Because you know what, what you're cooking with now. Well, yes. You know what they're interested in. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and the goal, I think, during character creation is to create a character, again, that is uh, a fertile base for generating interesting political intrigue RP. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's all these things. I mean, there's more that goes into it, but I think these are the main what, four points that I would sort of focus in on when it comes to character creation. Okay, so can you please review those four points clearly? Once again, for you at home, so you don't have to retake the notes. Okay, Just number the t- t- high level. one, yeah? the crunch, we can kind of ignore. Right. Uh, character motivations and goals. Very important. Right, alignment and morality. Super important. Laws and vulnerabilities. Yep. And then in-game relationships. Thank you. Yeah. You did a lot of talking, so it's good just to like summarize. So much talking. Summarize. For once in my life. For, no, 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 no. I no, talk about a lot, actually. You've done a lot of, uh, like, Expounding. not just talking, but, like, there's a lot of information yeah. there, right? Yeah. And, and once again, this is, I think, a heavier episode than we thought it might be, but it is very kind of rich and dense in information. Mm-hmm. Um, and this this is going to work against you, I think, a lot of times. If you if you try and eat the whole sandwich in one bite, this is or the whole elephant in, in a bite. Oh, geez, that's different. It, it's... Uh, that's a big sandwich. It's a big elephant. Uh, a tiny elephant, big sandwich. Um, Even a tiny elephant. Yeah, no, it's it's important. 
um, to keep these sorts of things organized. Mm. Right. Um, because like I said before, you're getting all these layers mixed on top of each other, all these powers, all these goals, all these vulnerabilities, flaws, all the relationships, right? Yeah. And eventually we're all just girls walking in spider webs. <laughs> that is, okay. Because <laughs> it's it's so much, so much going on. That is that a reference to Gwen Stefani? Well, it's one of her songs that she was a singer on. Good. I don't think it was specifically just her. I think she was still part of the band at that point. I was like, I was like, it could have been Mary Jane in Spider Man, but uh, yeah. Maybe that's what the song is about. Maybe that's what the song is about because she got wrapped up in a whole bunch of stuff. Gwen, call us. Let us know. <laughs> Uh, love you, by the way. Or Spider Man, you can call so, us. Too. So it's important to know what's going on so you're not just caught up in the webs, caught up okay. in the weeds, caught up in okay. the web, right? So let's talk about organizing some of these thoughts. Oh, back to the DM style. Okay. Right. Well, no. No? No. And I think this is for everyone. Oof. Okay. Organization is for everyone, not just organization. What? Uh, which they are, but organization. You want the players to be organized? Important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, typical DM. Typical. Typical. Um, I think <laughs> that when you're going into this sort of stuff, whether you are world, be- 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 world yep, 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 building yep. or world experiencing, right? You're DMing mm, or you're okay. PCing and playing. Yep. I think it's important to know your enemies and your allies, right? I think that it's going to be worth your time if you're playing a political intrigue, if you're getting into this minutia, if you're getting into Cloak and Dagger, if you're getting in to double, triple agents, falsehoods, truths, figuring out all this stuff, trying to figure out the whodunit on top of, you know, all of this stuff that's going on. They say that's one of the first things you need to understand when you go into war is who are your allies and who are your enemies? Uh, thank you, Confucius. That's probably Sun Tzu, but... They all look the same. They all, they all look the same? <laughs> wow. I, I like how you couldn't say it. Huh, I wasn't uh, thinking it either. Yeah. Uh, what I was thinking about <laughs> is faction guides. So this is a, a yes. set of notes or a page that you can dedicate or create for yourself that's going mm. to include kind of a concise amount of information. So at a glance, you know what's going on and then you can follow it up with your notes and whatever. So things that are going to be important for you to track as a DM, as a player. Yep. Okay. Um, obviously you need to have a name and probably a symbol. And oh. I, I like symbols because symbols can be used in the show. Don't tell portion of our game where they have a signet ring or you mm-hmm. see their mm-hmm. handkerchief mm-hmm. Enga- uh, engraved or, uh, embroidered. Ingra- Sorry. <laughs> bam, 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 hey, Goliath, they need, they need strong <laughs> Kleenex. Um, <laughs> that Charmin stuff, right? No bare butts. <laughs> Um, but the name and the symbol are very important. The symbol, like I said, is because it can live in the world. Mm-hmm. It can hide. That's yes. what you feed those perception mm-hmm. checks for, mm-hmm. right? Um, very, very interesting. Very, very cool. But also, now we know who we're talking to <laughs> when they have a name. We know what yeah. we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. uh, kind hey, of guy. <laughs> yeah, from Nameless. Who is it? Oh, that guy doesn't like that guy because... Oh, that right. guy did that to that, that guy. thing yeah. from that other guy. Yeah. Um, what are the names? But that's 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 a name. A guy is like a modern day who's on first. <laughs> um, after the name and symbol, obviously, who the leader of the faction is. Mm. Now, if this is this will not be just a single individual, right? At this point, mm-hmm. this is kind of talking about organizations, right? Who is the leader or the key figure or the influential members that you know within the faction mm-hmm. to form their leadership, right? They will probably have separate sheets later, but we just need at a glance to know who's in charge of this particular thing. Okay. Okay. The goals and ideology that you've discovered. Now, obviously for a DM, you can fill this out because you're creating the whole thing. Mm -hmm. But as a PC, you fill out the goals as you discover them, as you interact with them. Mm -hmm. Figure out what their ideology is as you interact with them. Figure out what their primary goal is, what that that thread, that main thread that they're looking after is, what their values are, what their beliefs are, what motivates them, what will they do to accomplish these sorts of things. Anything. Anything. Everything. Very important. Um, once again, this is trying to just be at a glance so you can remind yourself, right? This mm-hmm. is this top page. Mm-hmm. Who their allies and their enemies are, right? Also very important. Yeah. So you can kind of, if you got to color code it, if you got to do whatever. Really, really simplify at a glance. You to remember all of this information to keep it all as fresh as possible. 
Um, the resources that you've discovered, what power do they have? What assets do they have? What NPCs do they have? Whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, this also includes their strengths and weaknesses. Now, for a DM, this could be kind of we talked about the stats of, a, of an organization or whatnot. Um, that can be their strengths and weaknesses. How good they are at hiding their members' mm -hmm. affiliation. Or mm -hmm. their, how you know, fast they can transport goods. How all of this stuff. What are their strengths and weaknesses? As the PCs figure this out, they can fill it out. DM, you should probably already have this filled out. Mm -hmm. Another big thing for the DM and for the PCs to understand, especially in political intrigue, is the timeline of the goal that they're currently on. If you can figure out how long right, they are working or what they have to get accomplished by when, mm -hmm. this can be a powerful motivating factor. Yeah. Right? Yep. Desperation can be increased by going, I know, I know you got to get this done before winter. That yep. keep will not build itself, and you lost the road to the quarry. Well, That's, and desperate people do desperate things right? at the what price are, of... What are you willing to do to get mm -hmm. it done, right? This mm -hmm. is where we can apply leverage. But it's also great for us to remember what these things are at a glance, mm -hmm. right? Um, their current and recent actions. What have they been doing? What are they currently doing? Um, what kind of things have they been done? What have they done to who? This is super important. Uh, to keep updated on the top of notes and top of mental awareness. Um, because as I'll get to, uh, you need to conclude and do kind of resolution to this stuff in order to keep a political mm -hmm. intrigue moving. Yes. Right? Somebody killed Bernadette in the closet at the ball. Uh, we'll deal with that in a week. No, 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 mm. no. The guards got to deal with it now. The people got to deal with it now. Yeah. You got to deal with it now, right? A resolution needs to happen. So if we track with the current and recent actions, we can see what's going on yep. in that organization. Super important at a glance. And finally, just who the members are. Who do you know in general? NPCs, key figures, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if they are a key figure like that leadership, like I said before, next page should probably be them. Right, those key kind of things. But when yeah. we're looking at just organizing our thoughts and looking at what's going on to try and keep everything fresh, that top page kind of of the notes needs to be updated, needs to be live or as close to live as possible. Would you also add an entry for their smart power package? You definitely could. Now, I might include that under strengths and weaknesses. Mm, but or, somewhere, or I feel like resources. it's important. Yes. So you have in your mind this is the style like their their political intrigue style for this particular mm -hmm. faction now huh, me uh i included in my notes mm. because um we talked about creating an individual smart power package for each thing this is the task that they're trying to you know complete these are the things that they can draw on. they don't have to draw on the entire organization every single time unless they do but in in my notes it's their mission or their current action that they're trying to mm -hmm. undertake that has that power package attached to it. Interesting. Cause I feel like if you have the, the power smart power package attached to the overall organization or the character, mm -hmm. then you have an overall flavor for that character. And then the, from the player's point of view, they can sort of feel that this is that type of organization. This mm -hmm. is that type of organization. And if, yeah. So I mean, to each, to yeah, each other, anyways, right. Yeah. Um, I don't necessarily need that as top of mind awareness. Mm. But within their strength and strengths and uh, weaknesses, within their resources, I can kind of tell, or at least it's in my head, right? Right. amongst all the other lore that's flying around mm -hmm. here, what's going on and how they act. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that is kind of a key page, I think, that everybody should yep. have. Yep. Um, when we're starting to talk about, because your notes are going to be your savior, talking about political intrigue. Yes. Yes. And if you know, or you players know. players and DMs. Yeah. Uh, organizations we talked about before move the world. Yes. Right? Yeah. So we need to expect Armageddon. Oh. Now, oh. now, what I mean when I say this is all of the gears are not necessarily turning in the same direction. Mm -hmm. All of the machines aren't working together in concert. We're not talking about mechanics here. We're talking about people. Us. Um, Messed up. These things are going to be pushing that map, that landscape towards each other and it's going to cause crinkles it's going to cause mm -hmm. mountains it's going to cause all sorts of that's kind the of intrigue things. that's the intrigue right? yeah that's the resolution to all of these actions as they're turning and pivoting and 
doing whatever they're doing, that map that's happening is getting twisted and then smoothed out and mm -hmm. whatever's mm -hmm. happening to it is happening to it. So don't assume that everything is going to go smooth as a PC or as a DM, right? Yes. You uh, don't want it to be smooth anyways. You don't. Now, if it gets a little too chaotic for either side, maybe back off a little mm -hmm. bit and be like, what's going on here? Or have a conversation. Um, but ultimately, I also think that you don't necessarily have to have all of this thought out as the DM or as a PC, mm -hmm. okay. right? I don't need to know all of my political intrigue, all of my conflicts, all of my power, this power, that power, because I need to be able to kind of plan for conflict to happen, but not know what that conflict is. Right. Right. Because, yep. I, because I need to have that amount of wiggle room. That is the PCs. Well, it's like, that is the narrative. It's like building a character. Right? I, I'm going to have some kind of combat. I don't know what it is. Yeah. So you're just going to build whatever you think is best. Then you deal with whatever comes when it comes. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right. And there's that, that kind of spontaneous role play that's happening at the table. That wiggle room is necessary. On that's our the side magic well. of TTRPGs. It PCs. is the magic. Right. And so when we consider like, okay, let's talk about a town, right. Or a city, mm -hmm. whatever. Let's have one major conflict in the city. Pretty simple. Yep. Honestly, pretty simple. This thieves guild doesn't like that assassin's guild. Okay, great. They've got beef. Otherwise the city's calm. Well, that's, that's super easy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now let's put something else on top of it, right? Because it's a city. There's lots of things going on. So this guard captain wants to become that new kind of guard lieutenant, mm -hmm. but there's another guard captain that wants that as well. Right. Right. So now we've got this going on over top of that. And all of the powers, right? And all of the NPCs that are involved in that. Okay, great. Now let's add another major thing in and another major thing. And it's a lot. if you don't have these kind of quick gathering resources to kind of at a glance go, this guy wants to become a part of this. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. I got that. And this guy is fighting that guy. Okay, great. I got that. Like if I can't like see it quickly, it can get real lost real fast. Mm -hmm. And if there's key points that I need to deliver, or if there's information that I am attempting my best not to hide behind your terrible, terrible insight roles <laughs> and investigation <laughs> roles, you damn PCs. Like I, I want, want to I tell want to you, it away. I need I to, to tell you, give but... It away, but you just keep rolling it too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Your familiar is like, he's lying guys. He's, he's, he's yes, lying. Yes. <laughs> uh, free familiars for everybody. Uh, yeah. They can all cast the tech lie. Uh, <laughs> it's the best DM ever. Um, <laughs> Right. When, when you've got all of these things going on and there is all of this movement. And like I said, actions are being um, concluded. They're being mm. um, effectively kind of finished and the consequences are being kind of given out. Right. Resolved. All of the time res resolution is happening. Mm -hmm. um, you need to be able to quickly update the sheets as well as the long form right. notes. Right? right. You go, what the hell? I don't remember that. Flip, flip, flip. Oh yeah, that was four sessions ago, mm -hmm. right? I did that on a whim. I didn't have that planned. That's why I don't remember. Great. Back to the top page. Right. Right. Um, whether or not you do this in tabs or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. It's super important that you plan to be organized for political intrigue. And whether or not you've planned the chaos, you can plan for chaos. Right. N no, I just think <laughs> about back in the old days doing project management. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So um, also remember one of the good things that you mentioned before is that your goals can change. Yes. Right. And we talked about before with organizations, organizations need to evolve mm -hmm. right? as they move closer or they move farther away from their goals. They're going to change what they're doing to get back in the game or to react to what's mm -hmm. just happened. Yes. Or, right. Uh, you know, all you need to do in life to succeed is to get up one more time than they knock you down. Hmm. Maybe, maybe it's yeah. got some truth to it. Yeah. Um, but also, right. Organizations need to do this as well. Mm -hmm. Or they fold. And then where do those people go? They don't just disappear because the organization's gone, right? They feed into other organizations and carry with them those particular tasty hooks, right? The Thieves Guild is gone. But the Assassin's Guild has a new treasurer and he's from the Thieves Guild and he knows that you destroyed his last guild. Mm. Say goodbye to your membership. Mm. Oof. Um, because it's really important that we understand that when we start weaving out these things, those resolutions, those drops that we put in the pond and we get those ripples going out, 
there shouldn't always be positive reinforcement to that. Mm. There should always be somebody when you're doing a proper, like you said, there's always got to be a sacrifice. So there's always got to be kind of a bad decision yep. morally. There's always should be somebody who doesn't like what the PCs just did or what that organization just did. Yes. Right. You need to have that kind of constant grinding, like the rock, paper, scissors, mm-hmm. of things against each other that push towards more conflict. The end of the world. Right. <laughs> and that's, it, it's not Armageddon, but it's stuff happening everywhere all the time. And, yes. it's, uh, and it can feel like a lot if you don't organize yourself. Mm-hmm. Right. If you go completely no prep DMing, good luck. Good luck. I honestly, good yeah. luck. I'm not saying that sarcastically. Good Just luck. Have hire someone to take notes for you. Ooh, <sighs> I like that idea. Right? I like that idea. Yeah, I, I got one of those. <laughs> <laughs> so you're looking at you. My key takeaways for <clears throat> excuse me from this, so that you really remain true to the idea of political intrigue. Right? Mm-hmm. After all of this. Secret and intrigue. Yes, intrigue's in the name, I know. But secrets <laughs> and intrigues are super important, right? Obviously, yes. And having those kind of key things, maybe that's a key thing that you have on your DM's note, right? Um, This is uh, what I want to leave room for as a world builder or as a PC building vulnerabilities, right? As a secret that can come out during gameplay. I want to show the Mm. symptoms. I want to hide the black swan. Yes. Oh, that black swan is the root cause or whatever it is that you're trying to hide. Shout out to Chris Voss. (laughs) Um, right. So show the symptoms, show that the characters is shaking and quaking in fear. Every time you go into a cave. Yeah. Why? Because he just talks about his nightmare about bats. He has a nightmare about bats and bats and bats, but he never, never talks about being afraid of bats in caves. Yeah. Right. But he's, he's showing all of these different things and then you can easily draw the line and go, Oh, it's Batman. It's Batman. You're the Joker. (laughs) Um, so that's key takeaway. Number one. Make sure you leave room for the secrets and intrigues. Show the symptoms. Mm-hmm. Number two, update and evolve your information. Right? Oh, yes. Keep your faction guides up to date. Keep your campaign progress notes up to date. Mm-hmm. As the events unfold, add the new information in, add the consequences to the player's actions. Um, be responsible for your responsiveness. Mm, yep. Okay. And a way to do this is to make sure that you create accessibility to notes. So this is having a Google Doc or having um, a living kind of binder that the PCs have. Excel spreadsheets. That everyone, <laughs> Excel spreadsheets, baby. <laughs> have a living document that everyone can access. Maybe the DM has a DM version of this that has it all filled out. MS Project. The PCs, whatever, <laughs> get on your stacks, <laughs> get on whatever. Um, Maybe you even have a DM's version of this that has kind of the pertinent information pulled out. Weekly touch point meetings. Let them, you let them all be commenters so they can write their oh, yes. me, notes all yeah. over it, but they can see each other's work. Mm-hmm. Right? Or I have, I generally separate. I've got a PC living document that they can update. I will also update kind of key things as they uncover it, mm-hmm. but really it's their responsibility to monitor it. I'm just snipping out of work I've already done. I'm not yep. doing all new work yep. for this. But, but this keeps everybody in the know of what they should know or what is general information so that you don't get too far down the road. And somebody's like, I didn't, I didn't know that. I'm like, right. oh, I handed it out in my campaign I mean, primer. Especially because you're, you're playing like once a week, probably yeah. most people. And like, once a week to once a month to once a whatever. It's a long time because how often do you, if you don't take notes, you're like, who was this again? Yeah. Who are we supposed to deliver this to? Yeah. Oh, what? Right? And the DM's like, you know, you have to talk to this guy. And none of the players even remember who that is. Yeah. Right? So it's, yeah, it's important. Have those notes. Have you're like, oh, Finn, Finley? Finley? I <laughs> recognize that, that name. Yeah. Flip, flip, flip. Oh, he's part of this group. Yeah. Oh. Because yeah. for the characters, it's been like eight hours. For yes. you, it's been like a month. Yes. So it's yes. important notes. Take that um, keen mind feed. <laughs> in real life, I talk about wish. Crunch. Yeah. Yeah. Man, it's, I, well, that I is, envy and, those people. And even if you haven't, record your sessions. Um, mm-hmm. It's been a game changer for me. Yes. I love it. Um, I got over listening to myself. <laughs> and if you are you are recording it, make sure to listen to it. Spend time listening to it. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. it's it'll change your game. Yep. Yep. 100%. Um, but those, those are my big takeaways. Mm. Those are my real big takeaways. Talking about all of that stuff, those are my takeaways. 
I like it that I think you talked about having the the the, the faction documents. Yeah. Um, and it's good. I think you should have one for sure as a DM with like everything. Yeah. And it would be very kind and generous of you to have a a a sort of less detailed one for the players. As yeah, as a beginning, like here's in general what you guys would know about the factions, mm-hmm. and then from there, players, you go fill it on your own, add your own details and whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Um, again, because again, it's great for character creation, um, and it's also good for role play. Well, I love. I mean, even right. even when you go to a new town, here is a map that I printed out. Mm-hmm. Every single character treats their map differently. Some yep. some sorry, not character player, player <laughs> right? <laughs> What is this from this yeah. guy? Um, no, each, some players are just like, okay, great. And they take that pristine piece of paper and they tuck it into kind of a page protector and away it goes in the binder. Perfect. Others write all of their pertinent information yep. for that town on that page. Yep. So when they flip to it, they're like, oh yeah, these are the important things. Right. There. Apothecary. Possible hag. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, but yes, yeah, absolutely. Right. So, so how you want to do it works best for you. Great. But if you can all share and compile that information mm-hmm. of general knowledge stuff. Yeah. More better. Because I mean, at, at this point as players, um, we're, we, you need to understand all the political landscape for you to role play mm-hmm. properly. But I think if you want to uh, keep the flavor Ooh. of political intrigue, there are sort of specific things that you can think about while you're going through your live sessions when you're role playing. Nice. Um, right. So, like, how do you role play in a in a in a political uh, <laughs> like intrigue Jimmy, Jimmy campaign? James. Right. Is it is it different than non political campaigns? I think so. Yep. Um, oh, and is. and what I'm going to talk about won't guarantee winning. Like I said. Uh, but they will help you stay within the genre, right? And I assume that you want to stay within the genre. Unless you don't, well, then you ignore it. No, don't, don't ignore it, but you should still um, understand these things so that you know when you are stepping outside of the, the, the genre. Mm-hmm. Okay. So first thing, um, we talked about character goals. You need to role play those character goals. <laughs> yes, as if they're important to you. Right? Yeah. So align your character's personal goals with the campaigns. Again, uh, political context. And use those personal aspirations for the, of the characters to motivate um, your RP character actions and decisions. Mm-hmm. Right? Because if you have that there, just use it as a guide. And in, in every situation, you should have a good idea of what your character would do. I agree. Right? Um, Because it's the worst when you're like, what would my character do in the situation? And that's a sign that you haven't sort of built up enough of that base, Mm -hmm. right? Um, So if you need to, what? Uh, All your zigger belong to us. You said base. All your base. All your base base. are belong to us. Uh, (laughs) Sorry. Right, And and allow those personal, those character goals to uh, drive all your character interactions. And all their choices, right? Yeah. Base it on all those short-term and long-term personal objectives and goals. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, if you need to collaborate with the DM again, talk to your DM to integrate those personal goals into the overarching narrative. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, Especially if it's important to you. If you yeah. want it in there, make sure people know, make sure people know that you want it in there. Mm-hmm. Don't just like subtly reference it. Just don't. Yeah. I would like this. Yeah. If it's at all possible, I would like this. Right. Oh, okay. I didn't notice. Did you read my backstory? Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> but in political entry campaigns, I think, uh, more than other types of campaigns, uh, think about using subtlety and discretion when it comes to your role playing. Right? Ooh. Practice subtle communication. Right? And try to avoid revealing too much. You don't have to do this, but this is within the genre and the flavor. Okay? Be aware of your surroundings and sort of any potential observers or listeners. Right? If you need to use coded language, indirect communication, nonverbal cues, right? To convey information to each other, to NPCs. Right? Yeah. And if you're a DM, same thing when you're role-playing to the, to the players. 
I'm just trying to imagine how awesome it would be to have like all the first base, like first base coaches, for like Major League Baseball. Yeah, and they're just like playing D and D, and you're just like, like uh, thieves can't. It's their right. version of thieves can't for yeah, sure because all thieves. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but no, there's nothing. There's nothing saying that you cannot take the time to develop, train, and teach uh, a new language for your organization. Mm-hmm. Ten, or, ten or weeks with, minus your intelligence modifier. Bam. Or within your player party. Yep. Right. Ten weeks minus your intelligence. It's, it's great if a DM is like, "What are they talking about?" It's intrigue for them. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Next, think about using more diplomacy and persuasion yep. than your typical non-intrigue campaign. Right. Focus on uh, again negotiation. Right. Check out that episode. Check and it out. Compromise. In interactions. Yeah. Right. Ex- accept that compromise will happen. And it's really. Especially when yeah. you don't want it to. Yeah. And compromise is just a step in the direction that you want. Yes. Right. Sacrifice. Yes. What did you pay right. to get here? Master the art of building support for yourself. That is like key Ooh. to political intrigue. Yep. Right. Employ charm, compliments, flattery. Power intimidation yep. right all that's a blackmail if you need to depends on your character type correct right? correct right? make deals utilize negotiation tactics strategically again Smart take a power. take a look at our negotiation episode mm-hmm. it's filled with that it's- um but yeah building relationships is like 90 percent of political intrigue that genre I don't even say in real life right it's not it's yes not, uh what, what you, you know, know it's who you know, know. Right. Yep. And here is here is a, a sneaky way of weaponizing your character's lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm going to pay the extra gold per day to give me access to this level of individuals in this society. Yep. Why? Because that's where the rumors are. Right. That's Which tavern do I go to? Yeah. I don't go to taverns. I go to salons. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Why? Because that's the type of people I need to talk to. Correct. Connections with. Correct. Right. My other party member says, no, I avoid those places. I go to the seedy places. Yes. Right? Because our party needs different avenues for power. I'm going to spend the same as if I went to the high-end place. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to the low-end place to build influence, build reputation, yep. build that network. Oh, interesting. Right? Interesting. Okay. Um, How I don't often know. do you think about your character's lifestyle? Hmm? Right. Hmm? I, don't know. I don't know which episode it was, but I think I said, uh, make all the friends everywhere. Oh, right? yeah, you did say that. Specifically. Yeah. And for sure, political intrigue, do that. Um, and while you're doing that, you want to cultivate trust and rapport with those NPCs. Right? Yeah. Seek common interests, shared objectives, establish alliances, right? Mm-hmm. You want to invest time, like real lifetime, <laughs> in getting to know those individuals on a personal level. Like oh. spend the RP time to be like, find out what they like, what they right. don't like. Right? Again, in negotiation. Build, get ready for it. Build an NPC page. Get 10 mm. questions. Yes. Right? And you're like, hey, DM, can you fill this out between now and next session? Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to just drink with them and get to know them. Can you fill out whatever I would just learn? Okay, give me three persuasion and a, like a, I don't know, a performance mm-hmm. role. Okay, great. I'm going to take that. And the next session gives me time to fill it out. Yeah. Time to whatever. Well, it's, these are filled. These ones are left empty. If you want to know this, you're going to need to RP that out. Yeah. Right? And then we'll see. Great. Wonderful. Great. Right? Clear and defined goals. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And while you're doing that, cultivating those relationships, uh, offer help or favors yeah. to solidify those bonds and friendships and cooperation. Get your familiar. Right? Because what you're doing, you're cultivating that power. Back. <laughs> help action. Why does your dog, like, really Bo? like me? Bo? 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 It's because you always wear kilts. Yeah. <laughs> well, he likes kilts? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Friends um, everywhere. Because once you have those friends everywhere, those connections, then you can start gathering information. Yes. Again, Again. it is one of those power avenues. Yeah. And it's very important. Yes. Right? Well, it can be. Right? It can be. And it's, sure. and it's very on genre. Yes. Political intrigue. Yeah. Right? Um, I think Sun Tzu, even in war, says whoever has the most information wins. Right? Uh, scouting is like so important, both in combat and in social interactions. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, so actively seek out information through that questioning and listening when you're interacting with your NPCs, right? Develop a network of information informants, right? Yep. 
And it, they don't have to be people who like you either. Nope. Right? Don't avoid the people, the NPCs that don't like your character, that you nope. don't get along with. Um, because even in those situations, you can be observant, attentive to the details, how they, what they say, what they don't say. I mean, the, right? I don't know if you know this, but there's even like a, like a, a little table in the DMG that talks about when you ask people for mm-hmm. things mm-hmm. or gifts or tasks or whatever, a person who does not like you will still do a task for you if you get a like a 20 or higher on your perception, DC 20 or higher. Perception. Uh, persuasion. Persuasion. Right. Sorry. They'll still, they won't like you anymore, but they'll still do something for you. Mm-hmm. Right? Don't think that because they're a negative interaction with you or because they don't like you, that they still won't do something for you for the right reason. Well, also, and it doesn't mean that they always be negative. Correct. You with can you. change it over time. Right. And you'll want to. You will. Right. Um, so, will. and while you're doing this, like we talked about in your, uh, oh. previously, maintain those records and notes. <laughs> Keep track of that gathered information. Yes. Um, cause things will change. Yeah. Information is a soft power. It is. And it is, um, uh, one of the more effective types of specific power information. Correct. Correct. Right. Um, and then, because what are we what are we doing when we're making all these like connections with people with characters that like us NPCs that don't like us? Um, what you're doing is you're managing loyalties, and that is the core. That is the core of political intrigue, right? Uh, you're balancing conflicting loyalties and allegiances. Like I have loyalties to this guy and that guy. They don't like each other. I need to figure out how I can gain more influence here without losing too much influence here, yeah. right? You're maintaining it. It's like a, it's a, it's like a, it's like the worst job. It's like middle management. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and it's about making those difficult choices when there's a shift in alliances. And if you want, if you're shifting alliances, there's probably going to be a sacrifice in an alliance somewhere else. Right. right? And it's balancing all that, managing it. Right. Um, and determine when certain loyalties serve your character's interests when they don't. Right. Um, and for sure, stay attuned to the evolving political dynamics, the evolving loyalties, the, the evolving goals, mm-hmm. um, and sort of aspirations of the different organizations. What did you do? What did you change? Right. And hugely important. And because that change, how are you going to change? Yeah. Right. And that's where all the intrigue comes from, all the change, yes. all the dynamics. Yeah. Right. So yeah, as a player, think about these things. And I can, I can guarantee that you will feel like a political intrigue yeah. campaign. Yeah. And uh, build yourself a political empire. Do it. Do, Do it. it. Yes. Well, I think that's enough political intrigue dripping in your ear. I know. It's... For today. Um, because you obviously have homework. Um, we love handing out not homework homework uh, <laughs> here at Caffeine and Cantrips. So... Let us know. Do jump in the comments. Do mm-hmm. hit that like button, especially if you made it this far. Uh, costs you nothing. Helps us out greatly. But let us let us know what um, what was most impactful for you. Like what what kind of key yeah. thing about intrigue do you have to have in your games now going forward? Whenever you want to include some political intrigue, because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. um, that that kind of stuff is very cool. We love seeing that. We love hearing that. How uh, your games, your lives are getting a little bit better and you're enjoying them a little bit more just because of what we did. But um, we're going to check out here because that's the end of the episode. Um, check me on outside. How about that? How about that? Uh, and I am dying. So I was Byron. I am Sean. And uh, we are Caffeine and Cantrips. Thank you so much for being here with us. We will catch you next time. Mm. Or, or else. else. All we need to do. One more time. All we need to do is. <laughs> okay. Uh, what's the matter? Hmm? I just. <laughs> well, all we need. You. All you, we need is you to get us there. You like that soldier boy. And you.